We built the most expensive object in human history, and we're about to crash it into the ocean. But as this $160 billion marvel burns up over the South Pacific, a new space station is rising, quietly and with very different goals. One marks the end of international space cooperation. The other may reshape what comes next. The International Space Station wasn't meant to end like this. It began with a bold promise. Five space agencies, 15 countries and one shared ambition to build humanity's first permanent home in space. The journey started in 1998 with the launch of Zaya, a Russian-built control module. Over the next 13 years, construction unfolded at 28,000 kilometers per hour, with 36 shuttle flights, over 160 spacewalks, and dozens of rocket launches. Piece by piece, they assembled 420 tons of pressurized modules, trusses, laboratories, and solar wings creating the largest and most complex structure ever built in orbit. It's bigger than a six-bedroom house, equipped with two bathrooms, a gym, and a 360-degree cupola with the best view in the solar system. And yet, this marvel of engineering is now heading for destruction. Why? It's not a single failure. It's time itself. Traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, 28,000 kilometers per hour, the station completes a full orbit every 90 minutes. During each orbit, it experiences brutal temperature swings, plunging to minus 157 degrees Celsius in shadow and soaring to 121 degrees Celsius in sunlight. That 270 degree shift flexes the metal frame several inches each orbit. After more than 20 years and over 120,000 cycles, the stress is beginning to show. Tiny leaks have opened in the aging Russian modules. Space debris, even flakes of paint, have struck with enough force to scar windows and panels. Key systems, like ammonia cooling loops and CO2 scrubbers, have required emergency repairs. And despite upgrades, the station is still running hardware that predates the first iPhone. Maintenance now costs three to four billion dollars a year. And parts are getting harder to find, not because they're rare, but because the companies that made them no longer exist. So the end has been scheduled. NASA has awarded SpaceX an $843 million contract to build a U.S. deorbit vehicle, a special spacecraft designed not to dock or deliver, but to destroy. It will guide the ISS on its final descent, using a series of precise burns to slowly lower its orbit from 400 kilometers to 120. At that point, gravity and drag take over. The destination? Point Nemo, the most remote place on Earth, 2,700 kilometers from land, where space agencies have crashed satellites and spent rocket stages for decades. The irony is staggering. It took over 100 missions to build the International Space Station. It will take just one to end it. But before it vanishes into the ocean, how did something this fragile and this complex work for so long? In total, the ISS is made up of 16 pressurized modules for crew and experiments, nine truss segments, and dozens of connecting elements and docking ports. Built piece by piece over more than a decade, each component was launched separately, then assembled in orbit by hand. There's the Russian segment, Svezda, the main service module handling life support, flight control, and crew quarters, Poisk and Piers, which double as airlocks and docking ports, and Nauka, a long-delayed lab module added in 2021. The American segment includes Unity and Harmony, connecting hubs and crew access nodes, Destiny, the primary US lab, Tranquility, which houses the station's air, water, and even its gym, and the Cupola, a seven-window observation dome with views few humans have ever seen. Japan's Kibo and Europe's Columbus Labs expanded its science reach, while Canada's robotic arms turned the ISS into a self-assembling spacecraft. All of it is mounted to the integrated truss system, a rigid 110-meter-long backbone that supports critical systems. And among the most vital of those systems? The solar arrays. They rotate constantly to track the sun and generate up to 120 kilowatts of power, enough to power about 60 homes. That electricity runs everything, from life support and lab experiments to attitude control and the crucial reboost maneuvers that keep the ISS from slowly falling back to Earth. 
The ISS also recycles 93% of its water, including urine, into clean drinking water. Its environmental control systems regulate oxygen, CO2, humidity and temperature across a space longer than a Boeing 747. But this wasn't plug and play. The Russian and American systems run on different voltages, 28 volts and 120 volts. Their air pressures differ. Their docking systems are incompatible. To bridge these gaps, engineers built custom adapters, shared interfaces and redundant backups layered into a station that never stops running. But what made the ISS remarkable was the human side. Since November 2, 2000, there hasn't been a single day without people living in space. Over 280 astronauts, cosmonauts and space tourists from 23 countries have called it home. They've shared meals, traded languages and conducted over 3,000 experiments, from cancer treatments and drug development to materials you can't manufacture on Earth. It's even changed how we see our planet. From up there, crews have taken over 4 million photographs of Earth, used for everything from glacier tracking to disaster relief. But maybe the most extraordinary part is this. Through wars, sanctions and pandemics, through 9-11, Crimea, COVID and Ukraine, crews from countries in conflict kept launching together, working together and watching sunsets together. When governments broke off contact, astronauts kept floating side by side. Because for nearly 25 years, the ISS didn't belong to one country. It belonged to all of us. It was humanity's first true space laboratory, and one of the last places where Earth's borders didn't matter. But that chapter is ending, and the future of space stations won't be built the same way. As the ISS begins its final descent, a new station is already in orbit, smaller, newer, and built with a very different set of goals. Its name is Tiangong, which means Heavenly Palace, and for now it's the only other space station hosting astronauts in low Earth orbit. The timeline alone is remarkable. China launched the core module, Tianhe, in April 2021. By October 2022, two more lab modules, Wen Tian and Meng Tian were docked and operational. Three launches, 18 months, complete. The full station became active in December 2022, 12 years after the program began. By comparison, the ISS took 13 years just to finish assembly. So how did China move this fast? In a word, exclusion. Since 2011, the US has been legally barred from cooperating with China in space. That meant no access to the ISS, no shared science and no collaboration with NASA. So China built its own station and its own launch systems, crew vehicles and support infrastructure entirely from scratch. But independence also brought speed. Tiangong was built by a single agency with unified standards, custom hardware and no need to negotiate across five different partners. The result? a T-shaped structure with around 340 to 400 cubic meters of pressurized volume, roughly a third of the size of the ISS, but built with far fewer compromises. Inside, it features advanced life support with over 95% water recycling efficiency, automated docking and orbital maneuvering systems, flexible solar arrays and regenerative environmental control, and a high bandwidth communication system that streams live data to Earth in real time. Its robotic arm handles cargo transfers and maintenance, and thanks to modern automation, it operates with a much smaller ground team than the ISS. Since June 2022, Tiangong has been continuously crewed, with new missions launching every six months. By mid-2025, it had hosted over 1,300 days of human habitation. But this station isn't staying small. China plans to expand Tiangong to six modules by the end of the decade, including a multi-docking node and ports for commercial modules. Private Chinese companies are already designing hardware that could plug into the station's framework. It's also becoming a global platform. China has signed cooperation agreements with countries across Asia, Africa and Europe. Pakistan is expected to send its first astronaut. ESA astronauts are training for potential future missions. And through the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, Developing countries have begun sending experiments into orbit. And then there's Shuntian, 
a next-generation space telescope set to launch in 2026. With a 2.5-metre mirror and a field of view 300 times wider than Hubble's, Shuntian will fly in formation with Tiangong and dock periodically for upgrades and servicing. In just over a decade, China has gone from barred participant to space station leader. And with the ISS nearing retirement, Tiangong may soon become the only crewed station in orbit. But Tiangong won't be alone for long, because while one space station is retiring and another is rising, a third wave is quietly taking shape, this time not built by governments, but by private companies. And instead of one outpost, we're getting many, each smaller, each faster, and each built for a very different kind of mission. The most advanced project so far is Axiom Space. Their first module, HAB-1, is scheduled to launch in 2026. It'll attach directly to the ISS, function as a testbed, and then detach by 2030 to form the core of a new independent station. It's modular, commercial, and backed by NASA funding, but it's designed and operated by a private company. Another contender is Starlab, a single inflatable module developed by Voyager Space and Airbus. It's designed to support four astronauts, launching by 2028. Instead of assembling dozens of pieces in orbit, this entire station will launch in one shot. Then there's Orbital Reef, Blue Origin and Sierra Space's business park in space, 10-person capacity, flexible interior layouts, and a mission profile that includes research, manufacturing, and, eventually, tourism. Its funding is real. Its architecture is modular, and its backers include NASA, Boeing, and Jeff Bezos. Other companies are even more ambitious. Northrop Grumman is adapting its Cygnus spacecraft into a three-module research lab. VAST aims to launch expandable stations every six months by the 2030s. And Voyager Station promises artificial gravity and hotel suites, though its timeline remains speculative at best. These stations aren't just successes to the ISS. They're startups in orbit, each optimized for a different market pharmaceuticals, biotech, satellite servicing, or even luxury travel. But this progress comes with new problems. Each station runs its own life support system, docking protocol, and crew interface. There's no universal standard. In an emergency, you can't just hop from one to another like you could between ISS modules. And unlike the ISS, these platforms aren't about diplomacy. They're about design efficiency, cost optimization, and return on investment. What we're seeing isn't just a new generation of space stations, it's a shift in philosophy. The ISS was built to serve as science and cooperation. Tiangong is built to serve a nation. And the next stations, they'll serve the market. It took over a decade to build the ISS. It will take minutes to watch it burn up in the atmosphere. And what replaces it won't look anything like it. We're entering a new era, faster, cheaper, more modular, but also more fragmented. No shared modules, no shared command centers, and maybe no shared vision. The ISS wasn't perfect. It was expensive, complex, and constantly under repair. But it proved something no spacecraft ever had that cooperation in orbit, across borders, across systems, across decades, was possible. In the 2030s, we'll have more stations than ever, none like the ISS. Thanks for watching, and if you want more Megabuild stories, make sure to subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.